Hello and welcome to Logan Sounds Off. Today I'm talking to one of the most inspirational punk musicians as well as being an actor, comedian and solo spoken word artist, Henry Rollins. Henry, how are you? I'm good. How are you, man? I am brilliant. So for those who don't know you or aren't aware with Black Flag and the many different things that you've been in, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, born in Washington, D.C. in February of 1961. And so I'll be uh, staggering into age 63 in a, in a few days. Uh, I lived in Washington, D.C. until I was 20. And then I moved all the way across uh, the country to Los Angeles, California to join a band called Black Flag. And uh, that was 1981 to 1986. By 1987, I, I had uh, my own band, Rollins Band, and uh, we made records and played all over the world for many years. And then in the middle of all of that, by 1983, I was doing shows by myself, just on stage alone. Uh, and I continue to do those shows. I just wrapped up a tour of two years, 261 shows, 28 countries. Uh, I started a publishing company for books in around that year, 1983. Uh, and since I publish myself, there's no rejection slips, so I can just write a book and put it out. So I'm not saying they're any good. I'm just saying I, I keep doing it. And so um, also I started uh, appearing in, in film roles, TV, uh, voiceover work, radio work, um, uh, film, just uh, trying to keep things interesting and, and just do a lot of different things. Um, I come from the minimum wage working world, and so I, I, I come from $3.75 an hour um, doing kind of uh, mind-numbing, repetitive uh, tasks. And so one of the reasons I try to do so many different things is just I don't think I'm qualified to do any of it. And so why not give everything a try because I shouldn't be here at any of them anyway. And so I'm not trying to give anyone the impression that I think I'm uh, any good. Uh, hopefully people will understand I'm just trying to get away with it a lot of the time. That is just brilliant. Um, and you were saying, though, that you launch yourself at it and that you're not, you were saying there that uh, you're not trying to say you're very good, but you are. You were very well known um, on the punk scene from the start. And uh, when you started to play, actually, with the Teen Idols um, and one of the bandmates of Henry Rollins in the Teen Idols, Ian Mackay, I've interviewed, actually, so you might want to check that out. But you played with the Teen Idols when the singers started to stop showing up and you actually joined H.O.R. Um, from Bad Brains on stage. So what was all of that like? Well, that was uh, the moment with H.R. and the Bad Brains w was pretty it's a pretty cool story I'll, I'll give you a quick version of it there was a, a place maybe ian told you about called uh madam's organ and if you look in your dc punk rock history that's a pretty meaningful place and now i think it's a hair salon but it was just a house uh in a part of uh washington dc called adams morgan and when i was a young person growing up around there it's a place to get beaten up and get your bike stolen and now you can't even afford to park there. Uh, it's, you know, it's a much different scene. And so there was a, a, some hippies living in this uh, place and the, their living room had a small stage they built and punk rock bands would play there. And there's uh, Lucian Perkins, great photographer. Um, he did photos of, of bands playing at, at Madam's Organ, I believe. And if you go online, you can find uh, photos of uh, like me and all kinds of other people. Alec Mackay, Ian's very talented brother. Uh, I think uh, Ian uh, and other people at Madam's Organ. Anyway, one night, it's me and like yeah, at least 25 other people. And we're watching the Bad Brains on a stage about that high. And you can just walk up and the band will breathe on you. I mean, that you're that close to them. And HR looks at me between songs. And it's more like a party than a show. And it's a living room. We're all just kind of standing there. And uh, he said, um, Henry, you're a singer. And I said, oh, come on, man. No, I mean, you're, you're like the singer, man. You're HR. And he said, no, you're a singer. And tonight, you're going to sing with the Bad Brains. 
and he gets off stage, which, which is, again, this high, and he hands me the mic, and he points at the stage, like, you get up there. So I obediently hop up on stage, and I, I know these guys, so and I kind of know the audience, and they're like, oh, well, you know, he's going to sing. Oh, well, like, let's let's go get a break. And I kind of know the songs, and so he goes like, go, pick a song. And, you know, the, the rest of the bad brains are artfully going to play along with this charade. And I, I picked, I think, a mid-tempo song, Red Bone in the City. And it, it doesn't go at hyper speed so a mere mortal like me can even sing it. And so I, I kind of get through the song. And I believed, you know, HR pointed, do it, do it again. So I picked out something else. Yeah, you know, I, I stagger through. And then I, I hand the microphone back to HR and gratefully step off stage. The imposter has left. And he, and the whole time he's standing in front of me with a stern look on his face with his arms crossed. Like, you know, he's, a, he's inspecting my performance. And he said, he was like kind of angry. He said, see, you're a singer. And tonight you were saying with the goddamn bad brains. I said, okay. And, you know, the, and then the show resumed. And that was kind of, in a way, a shot in the arm where he said, you know, I see something in you. Or maybe he just wanted to see if I would bomb so everyone could have a laugh. I, I don't know. It was a long, long time ago. Uh, at this point, we're getting around, you know, like uh, 45 years ago, something like that. And I can't say that uh, like I went home that night thinking HR has given me the, the green light, but it, it was pretty damn cool, you know, to have someone of that magnitude kind of, you know, give you the nudge. And so soon after that, uh, I was in a band called SOA, which uh, ended up being the second band to release a record on Discord, the first being Teen Idols. And um, which came out, I believe, in the beginning of 1981. And by summer of 1981, I, I've auditioned to be in, in Black Flag and I've left town. And so as far as answering your question, like, what was it like? It, those days, uh, there was nothing but, in my opinion, like infinite possibility in that the scene was so small. If you want to meet the band, just walk over and talk to them because they're all standing amongst each other watching the other bands play. And even if we had like a big import band come to town, like 999 or The Clash, it was fairly easy to walk backstage or the band members might be milling around in the front of the venue or at the bar anyway. <clears throat> so to meet Joe Strummer certainly was cool. But it wasn't a high hurdle like trying to find Mick Jagger in a stadium at a Rolling Stones concert. And so this kind of music was like very actual in that you could walk up to the front of the stage and like hit the singer's foot. You can get sweated on by Didi Ramon. Like the experience was so vivid. And, and, and that, that happened to me. I stood right in front of Didi. The guy was like a faucet. The sweat came off him. Or, you know, Lux Interior would uh, ask you to help him take his pants off. And one night he, he kind of wriggled up to Ian and I and said, you know, fellas, help me get these pants off. And Ian and I, of course, dutifully peeled Lux Interior's black jeans off his legs. And, of course, we, they were inside out after we peeled them off. So we turned them right side out and folded them neatly and placed them on the stage. And after the show, we actually returned them to the dressing room. And that's how we met Nick Knox. But that's how those days were. And if you wanted to be in a band, it, you just kind of had to stand around and wave your arms. And someone would say, can you play bass? No. Well, then here's a bass. Like, you know, practices in five minutes. Like, learn. And so suddenly, uh, bands are popping up all around our little tiny scene. And I think this was probably happening in England and at least in the United States of America, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, Boston, New York. Are, are you kidding? Uh, and so uh, Arizona and on and on and on. And uh, certainly the Midwest, Michigan, uh, uh, the Necros. Um, uh, and so 
it was a time where you could, uh, I'm, I'm going to make a fanzine. And suddenly, you know, in, in an hour, you're making a fanzine. Or if you're a real visionary, like Ian Mackay, he's like, well, let's get a band going. Okay, well, let's make a record. And I watch, you know, I, I, uh, you might find this is a, a kind of humorous factoid. You're 12 years old, I believe. Yeah. Okay. I met Ian Mackay when I was your age. And we have been best friends ever since. And we are two very old ass men, as you can see. And so I watched Ian kind of get the whole, we're going to make a record idea together. I watched him build Discord records, you know, on notebook paper. And, uh, you know, he's a guy who could see what wasn't there yet, and he could figure things out. And to this day, he's still the single most amazing person I've ever met. Like, with no one, no one comes close. I've met some pretty astonishing people. And, um, but in those days, it, it was not completely unapproachable. And when you, when you, I grew up going to see, like, Arena Rock, Led Zeppelin, Ted Nugent, before he was talking between songs. I saw Ted Nugent. Please forgive me for my sins. Um, Led, uh, Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, Van Halen. It was what was available to an underage kid because you could be 15 and, you know, pay $8.50 and go stand 150 yards away from Aerosmith and kind of see them. They're this big on stage. And it was okay. Um, I never really thoroughly felt like that had rocked out because you're you're a mere spectator in a hockey arena but when you could get up close and stand in front of the band that was the change it also made things more approachable because you met the band after the show or it just seemed like well if those guys can do it why not us and i was never one of those persons who ever thought that about myself i thought never me and ian he's not a big ego guy he's his whole family he's got there's a lot of mckay's they're all highly intelligent, argumentative, uh, hyper literate, you know, they're readers and they like to discuss and argue. And um, Ian is of the mind of like, well, why not? Let's do this. Like if they did it, come on. And he figured it out. And so that's, that's what, what those days were like. It was exciting because you watched your friends who the summer before were, you know, on skateboards, on skateboard ramps, are now in the garage writing music. And that was Ian, you know, went from the skateboard to the bass. And well, actually was doing both. But suddenly your friends are in a band and now you're helping them carry their gear from their car trunk into some bar to play. And you're standing in front of your best friend watching him like play bass in the Teen Idols. And then sitting in the studio watching them record, like, whoa, a recording studio. And so all of that was, uh, well, as you can tell, I've never gotten over it. I'm still kind of uh, taken by all of it. And um, I was a fan then, I'm a, I'm a fan now. That is really an, a really cool and amazing way to get onto the scene. And you mentioned there with the uh, SOA, um, for those who aren't familiar with SOA, uh, is State of Alert. But the, the band, that was nearly the first time uh, you officially stepped onto the scene with your own band. So you were watching Ian uh, start up his own band, so you had some inspiration there. But what was it starting out? Did you, what was it like starting out? Did you have any problems that you encountered? Um, well, yeah, my, my severe lack of talent was a, an impediment. But I overcame it. I just yelled louder. If you yell loud, you're not trying to sing. You're just yelling. So if you're yelling, you're not really worrying about the notes. You're just putting it out there. I just remember um, there, there was a band, uh, I'm, The Extorts. This is a, a cool uh, micro factoid of Washington, D.C. music history. There was a band called The Extorts. Their singer wanted was going to leave the band and join another band and play guitar some band called minor threat what did they ever get up to and so uh ian and i go to watch the extorts play with the great lyle pressler who's a ridiculously talented talented guitar player we watch them play 
And so the word is this band is going to be looking for a singer kind of sort of after this show because Lyle's going to go and get in some band Ian's working on. And they, they said, well, you've got a big mouth. You want to do this? And I was like, well, why not? And so suddenly uh, Lyle, Minor Threat, is having band practice in Lyle's mom's basement. And I would go. I would go watch Minor Threat practice. And you could tell even at band practice, you're like, oh, man, they're going to take over. Uh, even like on day five, they were great. You know, just because the ingredients were perfect. Ian at the songs, you know, had the lyrics. Jeff's already an established drummer. Brian Baker is a great guitar player who's now on bass. And like, he's just a very talented guy. And Lyle Pressler, it turns out, is like this like surgeon, precise guitar player. And I was at the first Minor Threat show. And I, it was in a living room, 1926 Calvert Street on December 13th, 1980. And you just could watch it. You're like, well, Washington, D.C. now has its uh, best band because the Bad Brains have left. And it's obviously Minor Threat. Anyway, um, I meet the my future bandmates after the show. We all kind of grumble and, you know, don't really talk much. And within several days, at least, probably like October of 1980, we're at band practice and we're writing new material and I'm putting lyrics on a couple of their songs that now that Lyle has abandoned the the song, they said, well, you put your lyrics on there. And suddenly I'm writing lyrics. And so I, I did that pretty quickly. And within, I don't know, several inspired days, we had a loose assemblage of, of songs. And our sets, we played, I don't know, a handful of times. And the set was, I don't know, nine to 11 minutes long. Most of it was, are you ready? Yeah, are you ready? Yeah, are you ready? Like we, we weren't all that together. And so we would argue on stage in front of everyone, shut up, you shut up, and then get a song out and then take five minutes to tune. We, you know, but when we did play these like 30 to 45 second, you know, convulsions <laughs> of songs, uh, people seemed to go like, well, that was... Thank goodness that's over with. And so, but we got by. And um, we were on the same bills quite often with Minor Threat because, uh, you know, we're just all kind of like this next wave of bands along with like Scream. And we would play with the bands that would come to town, uh, like the Dead Kennedys or DOA or whoever is coming to town. Uh, like Black Flag came to Washington, D.C. And I believe Minor Threat opened, which is the obvious choice. And um, it was a really cool time. And I, I'm hoping this will not be taken the wrong way. Never once in my life have I ever had any fear of walking on stage. If you put me at a birthday party, I'll find a corner and hide. Um, I, I, you know, you put me in a crowd of people, I'll do my best to get by. Uh, I'm, you know, nervous. But if you put me on stage, no fear whatsoever. And I don't know what that's about. Uh, but what I don't want you to think is that I think that I'm, I've got it. I just don't have any stage fright. And I'm not saying I'm any good. Um, I just can go out there like, hey, here's a microphone. There's a cold audience. Like, go out and talk to him for half an hour. Okay. And Ian has that as well. Like you can, Ian doesn't need a band to be on stage. He can just go out there and talk to him and every, you know, he'll have them like he'll have them and he'll keep them. And so when it was time for uh, the first time SOA played, it was the same night Minor Threat did their first show. And I remember, uh, I think I'm just on, we're in a living room on a piece of carpet. And the first thing I did was I looked at my friend Jay, uh, who sadly passed away years ago. Uh, he was standing in front of me laughing. And I just punched him uh, right in the solar plexus. And that's how the show started. Wham! And we, we kind of lurched forward through the set. And um, it was a blast. And um, from then to now, 
I've never had a, a moment of stage fright, even when I'm, you know, walking onto the stage of the Sydney Opera House to a sold out audience on my own. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, and, and so being in that band was really fun because uh, was you know you're young you have uh, unbelievable amounts of energy uh you'll see uh it 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 doesn't last forever uh and your peers are great and the audiences uh were friendly we knew each other and then uh you know the waters got more choppy when i joined black flag that's like from going from like playing basketball with your friends into the nba where suddenly like you know getting knocked down and getting your doors blown off is a regular occurrence wow just coming on to the scene like that and especially where you were saying that uh just being at the same gig as minor threat that's really cool because you don't see many people who uh were able to say that they were at the first minor threat gig. And I read that a friend actually, the first time that you learned of Black Flag um, was that a friend of yours gave you and uh, Ian Mackay a copy of Nervous Breakdown uh, yeah. EP by Black Flag. Black Flag. Um, what was your first thoughts when you ha listened to them? Well, you know, Ian and I were music fans. We'd go to this one record store uh, owned by a guy named Skip Groth. Uh, who sadly passed away he produced our first records he helped ian get his first record pressed at a place called national uh, which is a still a pressing plant um that uh, uh i'm about i don't know five exits down the highway from sitting in front of you right now in nashville tennessee where i live and and so um let's see uh ian and i we would read like slash magazine anything from the west coast we would get bad, uh, poor, poorly recorded copies of Rodney on the Rock, you know, Rodney uh, Bingenheimer, his radio show, because we want to hear what's going on anywhere in America as far as like punk rock, you know, independent music. And we're looking at the fanzines, anything we can get our hands on from any source, a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. And you see this band, Black Flag, and it looks intense, and the logo looks dangerous. There's just something about it. Like, we want to know more. Even the name, it just sounds heavy. And so a guy named Mitch Parker uh, gave Ian and I the Nervous Breakdown EP. And Ian said, well, you're the record collector. Uh, you know, you're the, the guy who holds on to everything with the record. So you keep it. And so it's our record, but it's in a box on my shelf. But it's 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 it belongs to both of us. I'm just holding on to it for Ian. And uh, we listened to it, and it, at least for me, it fulfilled every expectation I had for what I wanted that band to sound like. You know, the songs are amazing. You know, it's Greg Ginn, Chuck Dukowski, <clears throat> and Keith Moore singing. And Keith is one of the most naturally uh, persuasive people I've ever seen on a stage holding a microphone. Like the charisma is like that of like Iggy Pop. Like the guy just has it. And if you've ever been in front of it, it's truly something to behold. Like Keith cannot miss. He's like the Zen Archer. Like in his sleep, he'll get it right. Anyway, um, we were fascinated by the record because it didn't sound like any record we had. And Ian, and this is a perfect example of Ian Mackay. Uh, we're talking at one point, I'm forgetting exactly when this was, and he very casually brings up, he was like, yeah, I was talking to Chuck Dukowski and Greg Ginn today. And like, you know, like it, everything in your hands drops. Like, you did what? Like, yeah, I called SST Records. Like, how did you do that? He's like, uh, you get on the phone and you ask the operator for the phone number. And he did that. And he, he basically called SST like, hey, I've got a label called Discord Records. Uh, you guys are going to be coming to Washington, D.C., like, do you need a place to stay? Like, you can stay, you know, at Beecher Street, at my mom's place, and, um, and on and on. And they took the call, obviously. And so Ian had talked to these two people, and I'm still in kind of like in arena rock mode. Like, you can't talk to the gods. 
And he is like, oh, yeah? Like, and that's a typical Mackay move. Like, how'd you talk to the president? I, I called the White House. I got him on the phone. That's Ian. Like, that's textbook Mackay. Anyway, uh, we drive up to New York to see them play. Uh, at the Peppermint Lounge. And then a day or so later, the Black Flag ventures down to Washington, D.C. to play the 930 Club for two sets. And I believe uh, Minor Threat was the opener on, on that. And um, I watched them all three sets. They played one show in New York and two sets, like a seven and a nine or whatever it was down in Washington. Small venue, you know, like they could pack it out. And I remember watching them from a fair distance away kind of angry and sad angry that i liked their music too much sad that i wasn't des cadena on stage singing i really wanted to be in that band and i'm not putting des down he's a, a wonderful guy and a really good singer great guitar player he's he's a he's a real gent uh, des is i just wanted to be the guy in that band mainly they were angry the way I was angry. I mean, they were burning angry. And I'm an angry person then. I'm an angry person now. I'm angry not at you, with you. Uh, but um, I'm just wired that way. And so I saw them. I'm like, that's, that's it. That is the band. And damn, you know. And at that point, I was wearing an ice cream uh, a shirt that said haagen wearing an apron with a paper hat on, scooping ice cream. That was my job. And I wanted to be with Black Flag. And that was, uh, we saw them in, I think, April of 1981. And by July, I was in the band. Uh, again, that whole thing of things being possible in those days. Uh, but Black Flag, the Nervous Breakdown EP, you know, now and then I'll listen to it, and it kind of uh, puts me in a state of awe, uh, as as it did then. Uh, it's a great record. It's a it's a it's a four track EP. Uh, it's a perfect record. It's a, that it's a perfect is, record. that's really really cool to be so aware of a band and then join it. It really gives a unique perspective when you're up there on the stage. But um, regarding the stage. Not only are you a musician, but you also, um, in the 1980s, you started to become um, a spoken word artist. And I think this is very interesting. And you did some great spoken word albums. And still, um, I know to this day, you're still doing uh, spoken word gigs. And my favorite uh, spoken word record that you have is Eric the Pilot. But what, why did you act? Yeah, it's brilliant. Why did you decide to become a spoken word artist? For $10. Uh, 1983, there was a local promoter in Los Angeles, a very enterprising guy. And he did these really cool shows. He would get a, a venue. Like his idea would move all around Los Angeles. One night it's in a bar. A week later it's in a small club. And the concept was we'll get like 15 or 20 people and everyone gets five minutes. And we're going to mix it up. It'll be an actor, two poets, the Jeffrey Lee Pierce of the Gun Club, uh, D. Boone of the Minutemen, Chuck Tukowski of Black Flag, Exine from X, and um, this uh, performance artist. And everyone gets five minutes. And so even if the person is bombing, it's only five minutes. And so you can be as outrageous as you want or unprepared as you want. It's only five minutes. Chuck Tukowski would be on the bill. Like, you know, Chuck the bass player in Black Flag. And like Chuck is this kind of visionary. He He's utterly brilliant. Like he's got a mind. They broke the mold on that brain. I, I No one thinks like that guy. He's, he's fascinating. Anyway, he would be on the bill. And so he would take the Black Flag van. And we lived way out in the sticks by the beach. And he would go into what they call the big smoke. Hollywood to go do his five minutes. I would go with him because otherwise you're just sitting around SST staring at the floor, looking at the bugs. And so I'd get in the van with him and we would go into town where, you know, go see a show, you know, they check it out. And so I would go. And one night Chuck does his thing. He'd read out of this notebook of like, 
hey, why he was, I, don't, you know, I can't speak for him. He was just completely dangerous. Anyway, after the show is over, the promoter guy comes up to me. He said, well, you know, we're doing a show in two weeks. Why don't we put you on the bill? And I said, to do what? And he said, I don't know. You got five minutes. Figure it out. And I said, no, man, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what I would do. He said, you got a big mouth. You'll figure something out. And, you know, he's right about the first part. And so um, he, he goes, we're paying like 10 bucks. I'm like, oh, because well, that, that's a lot of food you can buy. Like we were so broken those days and, you know, you're hungry all the time. So I said, $10? Damn, man. Well, yes, I'm in. And so, I don't know, a few Saturdays later, I'm on the bill. I believe at a place called the Lhasa Club. It's gone now. Uh, it's on Hudson and Santa Monica in, in Hollywood, California. And um, I, it's time for me to do my five minutes. And so for like two and a half minutes, I told a quick story about what had happened at band practice the day before, which uh, Greg Ginn had walked from our practice place to a liquor store to get some orange juice and a uh, two neo-Nazis in a car tried to run him over because um, we were playing our music in a, in a, um, a Hispanic neighborhood and the locals, local gangsters, like, you know, the local gang would come and hang out at band practice. And like, you're going to say no, you, you, you let them hang out, you know, and so that you just, you got to get along because you're leaving your gear <laughs> in their neighborhood. And they would come over and like, you know, what do you guys, punk rock? We're like, yeah, I guess whatever won't get us killed. And so we've got these uh, gangster guys kind of lurking around band practice and the local neo-Nazis didn't like it because we're, you know, white guys hanging out with brown guys. And so they see Greg Ginn walking to the liquor store and they try and run him over. And luckily Greg is like fleet of foot very fast. And so he runs up on a lawn and es escapes the car trying to run him over. And classic Greg Ginn, he dodges the car, goes to the liquor store, gets the orange juice, comes back. Uh, I almost got run over by two neo-Nazis in a car. And the rest are like, ah, run. He's like, uh, no, let's work on it. We went right back to band practice. This is, you know, a day in the life. And I told this story. And the audience's jaws hit the ground because it's gnarly. But for Black Flag, it's Tuesday afternoon. You know, it's just kind of, you know, the way it was. And then I read like two things that I had written uh, on the back of Black Flag flyers. And I looked at my watch, had the stopwatch on. And um, my f five minutes were up. I said, well, thanks. Good night. And people are going more and more. I'm like, well, no, the next person has to get on stage and so the show comes to an end and the promoter said um so did you like that i'm like yeah it was fun and people were coming up to me going when's your next show and i thought they meant black flag i'm like well we're leaving on tour or whatever they go no 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 the next show where you just talk i went well never i got this ten dollar bill i'm gonna go buy some dented avocados and some uh moldy cheese and live and um they said, you got to do that again. And I'm like, well, we'll see. And so the promoter said, look, you, you, you're, you, you're a natural at that. How about uh, you'll open for one of my poets at a poetry reading and we'll give you 15 minutes and $25. I'm like, well, okay. And after about a dozen shows of that, the poets unhappily were opening for me because I became the draw. And now it's like, you know, 30 minutes and like $30 or whatever. And by 1985, I went across the country doing shows, getting at least eight to 12 people a night, a little more in bigger cities. And then by 86, I'm invited to a, a, a poetry thing in Europe. And by 87, I'm doing like, you know, 15, 16 countries just on my own. And that's and then I just finished uh, 261 shows in 28 countries uh, several weeks ago, a uh, hundred years later. And so it it's kind of started wanting to eat and getting this like five or six minutes on stage, just making a fool of myself. 
and now I make a fool of myself worldwide. I mean, I, I have to say, I've listened to a couple of your spoken word albums, and I find them actually very interesting um, and very clever. And but what of your spoken word albums, uh, Get in the Van, On the Road with Black Flag, actually won the Grammy for the best spoken word recording. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Um, well, uh, that night, uh, I was nominated for two Grammys. Uh, one for the audio book for Get in the Van, and the other for best video for a song called Liar. Oh, this brilliant the, track. This, this, thank you. This would be the uh, 1995 Grammys. And so we are there days in advance doing the song over and over and over again because uh, the camera people need to rehearse because it's television and nothing can go wrong. And so I'm in this like sweated out T-shirt and a pair of gym shorts with a Grammys performer laminate around my neck so I don't get thrown out of the building. And in the afternoon, they're going to have the <clears throat> non-televised Grammys, which is for you know engineering. You know, there's a bunch of Grammys that given out are given out. The, the ones for all the pretty people are at night where you see it on TV. In the afternoon, they give it out for like the, uh, engineering and audio book, like the kind of like, you know, lesser known uh, uh, parts of the entertainment business. And so the audio book Grammy part was going to be in the afternoon. And so I, I just wandered into the venue with the guy who's going to be doing our front of house sound, a really talented engineer named David Bianco who made a lot of records with Rick Rubin. And Bianco was so talented, and sadly he passed away. Wonderful guy. And so I said, hey, David, I'm going to you know, go not get a Grammy. Like, let's go sit down and watch me not get a Grammy. And we're sitting there you know, laughing because I'm up against uh, someone reading, I think Charlton Heston reading the Bible, you know, the good book, and someone else doing an audio book about the history of baseball. So I, I'm up against the Bible, God, and America's favorite pastime before gun homicide. And so um, who, how can I win against those mighty odds? And I said, David, if I win, I'm going to go on stage and I'll say, you know, David, I love you, man. He's like, oh, very funny. And we're sitting there with our, you know, working men's laminates on. And they go and they, they read out all the names and, you know, Henry Rollins get in the van. I'm like, wow, that's my name through the sound system. And the winner is Henry Rollins get in the van. And David and I look at each other like, excuse me? Like, did that just happen? And he goes, go, go, go. So I walk down the aisle to the front of the stage and I got to walk up the stairway to get onto the stage. Two security guys come together and they look at each other because I I look like, you know, road crew. You know, you can see the sweat stains on my shirt because I've been singing the one song all morning. And they're, they they look at each other like, I'm like, no, 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 I, I'm that guy. And they look at someone else because no one rec no one knows me. You know, I'm just not familiar in this arena. And so someone finally goes, I don't know, like we're, we're burning daylight. Put them on, put them on. And I walked up on stage and I said, I bet it's interesting for people like you to look at someone like me holding something like this. And I'm holding the Grammy. It doesn't have my name on it yet. That takes like six weeks. It comes in the mail, literally. So they give you a blank Grammy and you're supposed to hold it up and you have to give it back. And um, I said, I'd like to thank you, know, my lawyer, my manager, and David Bianco. I love you, man. And I see David dive off of his seat onto the floor and they like kind of snatch the Grammy out of my hand and shove me off stage. And I am sent down the hall to this series of like, got to go do press. Like you're just like sent into this world of MTV and, 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 and they give you a different Grammy per appearance. And like you hold the Grammy, you talk for some radio show or something uh, you know, E entertainment, and then they take it away from you and then you shoved into another room. And um, that took like another two hours. And I get kind of shot out the back of that back to band practice with like, oh, wow, 
And um, weeks later, a Grammy comes in the mail. And uh, I almost immediately, you know, I, I in those days, I, I had, you know, my office with my staff, you know, we running the book company. <clears throat> and we would put the Grammy in on different people's desks every day. And everyone would make fun of it. Like they'd all take pictures with it, and like, you know, you know, hang stuff on it. Like, thanks very much. And finally, everyone made so much fun of it, I just gave it away. And um, years later, my manager, Heidi, the big boss in my life, she goes, where's your Grammy? I'm like, I gave it to a guy, I don't know, like 20 years ago. She goes, you got to get it back. I'm like, ah, she's like, no, get it back. So I called the guy and I said, uh, do you mind if I, you know, I, I'm getting the, you know, the, the boss is giving me a bunch of static. You mind if I get the Grammy back? He goes like, I'm looking at it right now. It's been like sitting on my desk, like the whole, you know, for the last, you know, five presidential administrations. Come and get it. I drove to his office and I put it in my Subaru Outback or whatever I was driving. And I drove it back to the office and it's, it's around here somewhere. I put it in a box <laughs> and I, I, I'm sure I marked the box, but if you told me like, go run and find it, I don't know where it is. It's in this building somewhere. Wow, that's a really great story. And just even there, you were up with a reading in the Bible. That is just, and the yeah. fact that you came in not knowing that you were going to come out with the Grammy, that's really cool. And you you were saying there like uh, earlier that you did everything. And uh, soon after this, and even during this, uh, sorry, uh, when you were getting this Grammy, you mentioned there about the track Liar, but that was from Rollins' band. And um. You started the Rollins Band. You got a ton of people together and started making music. So what inspired this to start a new band and make new music? Well, uh, Black Flag ended very suddenly and very acrimoniously in the summer of 1986. And I reckoned I had two choices, either hit the ground or hit the ground running, either have a little crisis or just go new day, new band, let's go. And I went for that. And there's a guy I grew up with in Washington, D.C. named Chris Haskett, who was in a really good band called The Enzymes, great D.C. band. And uh, Chris and I, you know, we grew up together. I would always go see his band play. I'm a huge Enzymes fan. Chris is a great guy. Um, and he he used to live in England. He, he was uh, living in Leeds. And uh, when Black Flag would play in England, he'd hang out and we'd, you know, he's a DC guy, but lives in England, went to school there. And he said, well, you know, if Black Flag ever breaks up, ha ha, like that'll ever happen. We should make a record. And I said, well, let's do that. And so Black Flag indeed broke up. And I was in Washington, DC, uh, you know, kind of um, licking my wounds. And Chris was there on a brief break from living in England. He was back visiting his parents. And I somehow knew that. And I called him and I said, well, man, uh, the Eagle has landed. The band is over. And he said, great, no problem. Uh, I, I, I have a place in England. We can live and practice. I've got a rhythm section and like fly out to England and we'll make a record. And in those days, you know, I had been around SST records and discord. I understood it is possible to write songs and make a record. That is not impossible, not easy, but not impossible. I started writing lyrics for songs, started coming up with riffs in my head because I'd been <clears throat> at it at this point for a few years, knew my way around it a little. October of 1986, I fly to England. I think I took a bus up to Leeds out of Heathrow and I'm living, uh, yeah, there's a, a bunch of streets with Harold, like Harold Court, Harold Mount. I'm living in the Heralds near the university in Leeds, beautiful city. And I meet uh, these people that uh, Chris has assembled. We're young and terrified and broke. And we write a bunch of songs in like a week. And we record them in a few days with my meager savings. So we made the record. We couldn't even afford the, 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 to keep the two inch tape. So the multi-track tape, I believe, got recorded over as soon as we finished mixing. So I've got the mixed down tapes, but the master tapes, yeah, who knows? Anyway, um, I go back to America with this bunch of tape under my arm. And um, that became a little solo record. 
And then in the spring of 1987, I called up some people, Chris and uh, a rhythm section, who I knew. And that was April of 87. By May, we're on the road. That's the Rollins Band. And we wrote songs while we were touring. And then the tour finishes almost a year to the day. We were in England the year before making the solo record. And that became a record called the Lifetime Album. And I called Ian from a payphone in Leeds. I said, I've got, you know, a bunch of very talented, argumentative bandmates. They all want to produce the record, which means it's going to be a nightmare of like everyone walking over and pushing their instrument up in the mix. How about a little more bass? How about more, some more kick drum? You'll never get anything done. And the band will be like, you know, <laughs> killing each other. So Ian said, um, you know, Ian can produce a record. He's quite good. He goes, um, I'll fly out and produce the record. I said, I can't afford, I don't have enough money for your plane flight. He was like, don't worry about it. And that's, again, that's Ian. And so I said to the band, Ian's going to fly out here and kind of be, you know, the OG peacemaker and he's going to produce it. And Ian commands a lot of respect and everyone kind of went, okay, that we can agree on. Like the sober judge will mix the record. So he shows up. All right, lads, let's go. And we go into the studio and like the band, like, we'll, we'll do another take. And he's like, nope, that's all the time we have. That take was good. Moving on. And we recorded and mixed the entire thing in five days for like, I don't know, $2,200. And then Ian flew home. I left on tour. I stayed in Europe and did a whole other tour on my own. And I was paying my band members back because I owed them all money because the tour bombed. Uh, and um, came back with the tape under my arm. And that record came out uh, later and uh, on and on. <clears throat> and so it was just basically determination to stay doing music. And it should be said, uh, no real plan B. You know, I, I, I never had it in my mind. I'm a musician. I, I'd run away from that accusation. But hey, man, you know, uh, I still had something in me. I still wanted to be in a band. And so I figured, um, let's just make it happen. And the band ended up uh, playing all over the world, everything from the Grammys to Woodstock, and uh, had quite the time, you know, and um, not always fun. Like being in a band, like ask anyone who's in one, it's not always fun. Sometimes, you know, it's when you're not trying to kill everyone else in the band, you can kind of, uh, eh, it's okay. And so um, it was a, a, a hell of an experience, but basically it's kind of um, demonstrative of many things in my life. I just wanted to do it. And I just went for it. You know, I, I'm, I have a high school education. You know, I, 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 I barely got out of high school. So I'm, 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 I'm the dimmest bulb in the chandelier. And so I've been kind of winging it, as they say, since 1979. I've just been, you know, well, let's try this. <laughs> so like in the late 1980s, uh, when I started getting asked, hey, you want to be in a movie? why not? Can you act? No. You know, why let that stop you? And so I, you know, ended up being in a bunch of movies and whatever else. But um, it's just been the idea of just going for it. And uh, I've always considered myself nobody from nowhere. You know, I'm Henry from the ice cream store. What do I have to lose? If I'm doing a movie and they go, you suck, get out of here. You're not telling me something I don't already know. And so why not run at it? You know, they're handing out pencils, like go get some. And so um, that's kind of been from then to now, just uh, trying to keep it interesting, you know? And um, interesting things have come my way. And I've kind of, uh, you know, found myself in the right place at the right time. I actually want to ask, um you about one very interesting thing that happened with the Rollins band where you actually the Rollins band appeared at Lollapalooza um, that must have been really cool to appear at such a legendary festival yeah we were uh, on the first Lollapalooza 
And we were the first band on stage because we're the opening, opening, opening band, the band that no one gets to see because they're all still asleep. <clears throat> and so we, we were the first noise ever heard at the first ever Lollapalooza. And the year before, uh, Rollins Band was doing a lot of shows at Jane's Addiction, one of the best bands I've ever seen. And they liked us, we liked them, and we were a good opening band. We, the bands got along, uh, their audience didn't hate us, and so it, it worked out. And one day, we're following them you know, in our van, following their, their tour buses. The band, uh, two guys would be in one tour bus and the other two guys would be in another tour bus. They were living large. And so their road manager said, uh, Perry wants you in his bus today. And so for the first time in my life, I walked into a tour bus and I look like, you know, uh, Bright Lights, Big City. I'm looking around like, a, is that a bathroom? You guys have a bathroom on this thing? They're like, yeah, because they didn't understand I'd never been on a tour bus before. And so they go, well, Perry wants to talk to you. And so I go back in the back lounge and he's like, you know, hey, man, I'm going to do this uh, festival called Lollapalooza, man. And he explains Lollapalooza. He goes, what do you think, man? I go, it sounds like it'd be pretty cool. And he goes, okay, you know, you can go. <laughs> I go back to the front of the bus. And later that day, uh, our my road manager comes up and says, hey, Perry and his road manager want to have a word with you in the Jane's Addiction dressing room. I go in there. And he goes, you know, hey, man. <laughs> I'm doing a bad Perry imitation. Anyway, he said, um, we want Rollins Band to be on the first half of this Lollapalooza tour happening summer 1991. And uh, you'll be on the first half and then um, you'll leave and some other lucky band will be on the second half and all the other bands will do the whole tour. And uh, there, I don't think there was a lineup uh, yet. Uh, if there was, I'm not remembering it. Anyway, I said, okay. And so I've been at this a long time and, you know, I, I'm not one to blow my own horn, and I have no idea why I did this. Maybe I was just mad. I said, so uh, the one who's been treading the boards, getting ashtrays thrown at his head, I get half the tour, and all these other bands get the whole tour? No. I'll take the whole tour or no tour. And Rick Smith, the road manager, looks at me like, Wow way to kiss goodbye a really good opportunity and i think the road the uh, ted the manager of jane's and perry both looked at me like whoa you got that's a lot of spine there old man and then one of them said you know what you're right you know and you guys are cool and we like you screw it you'll be the opening band on lollapalooza I was like, whew, and I, I think I probably could have renegotiated if they said, no, you know, you'll get half of the tour or nothing. I would have gone like, oh, thank you. I would have taken it. You know, they wouldn't have said, you know, no and kicked me out of the room, I'm sure. Nice guys. And so um, I basically dared and got it and um, ended up being on the first ever Lollapalooza tour. And so there's a thing you'll see backstage uh, called a day sheet. And it gives you the running order of the bands. You'll see it like somebody from the production office wax it up on your dressing room wall every day. And it'll tell you, here's meal time, show time, uh, curfew, you know, all of that. And any things that need to be mentioned, like, hey, a TV crew will be here for Jane's Addiction tonight. Get out of the way, whatever. And I, I took the day sheet down from the wall, and I still have it 122 years later. It says, uh, Jane's Addiction welcomes Rollins Band to Lollapalooza. And uh, that's how we got on the tour. And I've done a, a few tours in my life, and I, I think that might be the funnest tour I ever did, where I hated it going away so much. The last day was Seattle, I believe. And I I was so, like, lump in my throat this, like happy place of touring was going away i didn't want to stay so i finished our set opening set i had a ride planned i showered up changed up 
I had, you know, a duffel bag of clothes and I got a ride to the airport. And by the time Jane's Addiction was on stage, like by the time like Living Color was on stage, I was already back in my little place in Venice, California, wishing I had not stupidly gotten on a plane and left the site. I just didn't want to face the end of it. And I regret that to this day, that I couldn't have been there on the side of the stage because I, I watch Jane's Addiction every night, like every night. And um, it was a great time. Uh, Ice-T and I would eat lunch every day. You know, he's a, a professor, that guy. He's so smart. And he said, "You come and sing with body count. I'm like, okay. And so I ended up doing like two sets a day. I'd go do my set, and then I'd get on stage and sing a few songs with Ice-T every day. And uh, we had a really good time on that tour. And then, you know, Lollapalooza, you know, still goes on to this day. It's it's quite a thing. But um, the, on the first one, it was kind of this interesting social experiment. Like, will it work? And every day, you know, you know, yeah, it worked. Like 20,000 people showed up every day. But no one was ever sure that anyone would show up because it was kind of sort of untried. You know, it was like this new thing that Perry had cooked up. And uh, thankfully, the lineup was such uh, that it attracted enough people. Certainly, Jane's Addiction was a huge draw. But when you put in Living Color and Susie and the Banshees, you know, you're going to probably be doing okay. But what yeah. was really fun to watch was Nine Inch Nails because they weren't big yet. But as the tour went on, Meanwhile, on MTV and radio, they were becoming big. And as far as crowd reaction, by midway through the tour, there's two bands driving 20,000 people crazy, Jane's Addiction and Nine Inch Nails. And by the time the thing was over, it was like overwhelmingly clear Nine Inch Nails is probably going to take over the world. And for good reason. It's, it's a great band. But it was crazy to watch that happen during the tour because they'd go out like the first five shows and they got an audience. Ten shows later, it's like uncontrollable. By the time we got to the Midwest, it's Beatlemania. It's nuts. And then I think towards the end of the tour, they had to leave because some band called Guns N' Roses wanted them to be their opener. And um, bands started to fill in, like the Violent Femmes and Fishbone bands like that would come in and do the fill-in slots because uh, Nine Inch Nails had to say farewell. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah, yeah just, uh, I actually didn't know that was the first Lollapalooza, but that is really, uh, just really incredible that you got to see that all happening around you. Yeah, and, um, wow, though, um, I love that story. But now I want to move on to something completely different sure. that um I think is very, very interesting. Um, you had a show called Henry's Film Corner on the yeah. Independent Film Channel. Now, did you get any backlash from people from your ratings of films or your reviews of films? Did anybody react differently to how you thought? Um, not that I'm remembering. Um, uh, I, I think uh, some people were surprised to find me doing a film review show, but hey, man, why not? Like it was offered to me and I like films. And so I said, sure. And so that uh, started, I think, four years. I was on the independent film channel doing different shows. And um, it was a, it was an interesting time. I got to go see a lot of films. I interviewed some really interesting actors. And uh, it was a very enjoyable time. I learned a lot. And uh, I ended up interviewing a whole bunch of people over the years uh, on the Independent Film Channel. And um, it was just, you know, it's that, it's that thing. I, I don't fit in anywhere. So why not try everything? You know, I, I, I feel at home on stage. Um, but anything else, I'm like, yeah, man, I'll go for it. Because I can take that which I already have and apply it, you know, focus, discipline, tenacity, preparation, you know, taking the job very seriously while not taking myself seriously. 
And that allowed me, you know, the, the actors would say to me after I'd interview them, like, wow, you really did your homework. I said, yeah, you're Samuel L. Jackson. Are you kidding? What, I'm going to sleep on this? Like, you must respect the person you're interviewing. You know, you must do your due diligence and prepare. You can't say, were you ever in a band? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't. You, you, you got to be ready. And so that's how you show the person you're interviewing respect. And I think that's a good way to get a good interview. I mean, I've been interviewed by a lot of people. And some people, you know, it's a weekly newspaper. They've looked at your bio for like 20 seconds. They get you on the phone. And they basically, you know, don't know anything. So you have to do the interview for them. Like, so you are, I'm, my name is Henry. And, and you just kind of fill it in for them. You give them their three inches of column and then hang up and move on to the next one. And I've done that, you know, if I had a dollar for every time I've had to do that. And so when I started interviewing people, I tried to think, well, what are the interviews I enjoyed? Well, the ones where the person really was prepared and had an objective, you know, they, they had something they were interested in and ripping out of me. And uh, so I went into these interviews uh, very agenda driven, like I was after a thing, a factoid, a story or a point of view. And I think the people I interviewed appreciate it. I never had anyone storm off the set, so. Wow. Um, I know when I originally uh, read up about that, I went, that is so different to anything you've ever done, a film review show. But something else that you did um, was another TV show that you had was the Henry Rollins show. And um, you had some really cool guests on this, such as Chuck D, yeah. Ozzy Osbourne, and you also had Frank Black, just to name a few. What was it like meeting all these really influential, famous, and just just pure geniuses in their field? Well, I'm you know I'm a fan. I was a you know I, I went into music as a fan. You know I joined Black Flag as a fan of Black Flag, and so I'm basically sixty three. I'll be sixty three in a couple of days. I'm still a fan. You know, I go to the show, I buy the t-shirt. I'm always the oldest person in the building. It's, it's, it's funny. Um, and so I already had the records. Like, who doesn't like the Pixies? Are you kidding? And like Frank's solo records are, you know, uh, Charles. Um, Frank Black's solo records are good too. And, you know, Public Enemy, I, I just, it's one of the, the best bands I've ever heard. And, and Chuck is one of the most logical, you know, clear thinking people I've ever met. And so I was a fan, but I did my preparation. And so whenever these people would walk into the studio and Ozzy, you know, I had done shows with Ozzy and like, he's one of the coolest people. Like, you know, he wears his mega stardom very well. He's a great guy. And uh, all of these people are cool. Most musicians you meet, they're, they're, they're pretty cool. And um, it was a great time, you know, cause I was a fan already. I, I knew the records records backwards and forwards. I already had questions. I just wrote them out, memorized them. And when they came into our building, I was kind of like a spring-loaded trap. Like, and go. Ah! I just kind of like throw myself at it. And um, I, I run into Chuck every few years. I saw Chuck uh, last summer or the summer before. We were both um, Shepard Ferry, the great uh, graphic artist. Uh, he, Chuck did the music and I did the intro for an opening for Shepard. So Chuck and I were both, you know, on, on the, the staff that night. And uh, Chuck's great, you know. And uh, uh, one time I was hanging out uh, after a Johnny Cash show in the VIP area with my, you know, little sticker on. I went there with Rick Rubin, so I got in with all the swank folks. And uh, I'm milling around, hanging out with Joe Strummer, who was there. And uh, yes, I'm name dropping. And, um, <laughs> and th there's Frank Black. And, and um, I've known him since the Pixies days. And uh, I, I said, hey, man, what are you up to? And he said, hey, you and I are both, you know, washed up. I said, probably. He said, end of our careers. No one likes us. I go, right. He goes, OK, how about this? We're going to go to Las Vegas and be a doubles act. Hank and Frank, what do you say? I said, let's do it, man. And then... <laughs> It's so uh, funny. And so uh, getting to meet all those musicians was really, really cool. And having 
live musicians on the show. The Stooges, Dinosaur Jr., Slayer. Are you kidding me? We had Sinead O'Connor perform. And, like, you know, I, I really miss her. You know, she was a very special performer. Like, that, that voice is unreal. And when I watched her sing, she sang without effort. Like, it was just perfect. She'd open her mouth. This voice comes out. Like, every hair on your arm stands up. And um, we had a really good time doing that show because we just got incredible interviews. Gene Simmons, like he's, you know, he's different. Um, funny guy. Uh, and we had amazing bands play. Like you're standing in front of the Stooges. They're playing in front of you. Like, you know, pinch me. That's my favorite band. And, um, it, you know, we were super lucky. And with the Independent Film Channel, we would send them the finished show. So you send them the show, and in show business, they send you back what they call the notes. Like, we love the show, but you need to fix this, 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 and this. And, the I, you know, they'd call me like, okay, well, the notes came back. I'm like, oh, we have to basically start again. And the notes were, there's no notes. They loved it, and they're ready for next week's product. And so the Independent Film Channel never told us, hey, can you cool it? Hey, can you slow down a little? They never said anything other than, great, we can't wait for the next one. And um, for that, I cannot thank them enough. Because other shows I've done, like National Geographic, History Channel, notes, 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 like, you know, you're in post-production, like thinking you're never going to get out. Yeah, that's, it's great to hear that uh, feedback like that, um, especially like a lot of people are fans of what you do and to also interview people and you just jumped into it and um, I bet it must have been incredible to just get feedback saying that they loved the interview and you just jump at it it just shows great dedication and as well as this you also had a radio show on Indy 103.1 called Harmony in My Head is that from the Buzzcock song? Absolutely it's a perfect song from a band <laughs> that wrote one perfect song after another um, it's one of my favorite songs of all time. Great Steve Diggle vocal on that one. Yeah. Uh, putting down the great work of Mr. Shelley. Uh, but it's just a, it's a great song. And Ian and I, we were buying those seven inch records that informed the singles going steady record. Uh, we were buying those records as they were coming out and they would you know, drift across the Atlantic ocean. And I wasn't reading like sounds or enemy or melody maker. So I don't know when the next buzz Cox record is coming out. I would just stagger into the record store and like, oh, look, there's another one. And you'd go home and put it on. And it's like two perfect songs. Like, in, in my opinion, um, all the United Artists era buzzcocks, which would be, you know, all that that early group of songs. There's not a bad one in the bunch. Uh, it's just amazing music. And um, so I had that radio show. And uh, you know, radio, like real radio, like network radio is really expensive. It's like a furnace that burns money. And so you have to shovel money into it, like, you know, like, like you're trying to put coal into an engine to make a train go down the track. And Indy 103, we were having way too much fun. Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols, he's got a show. Rob Zombie has a show. Um, uh, one of the members of uh, Jane's Addiction has a show. I've got a show. It, it's madness. So, of course, they run out of money. Indy 103, sadly, goes away into the sunset. And about a week later, KCRW, the big national public radio affiliate in Southern California, uh, Jason Bentley, the, uh, the uh, show manager, he calls me and said, hey, I heard Indy 103 went away. And I thought he was calling to, you know, make fun. And I went, yeah, pile on, pal. And he went, no, 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 I'm sorry about that. We uh, we would like to know if you'd like a show here at KCRW. Whoa, that was 15 years ago next month. I'm still there. And so I, I've been on the radio for about 20, the last 20 years. And this room I'm in, this is where I build my radio show. This is my little makeshift uh, studio that was built in, a, I'm in an attic in a crawl space. <laughs> A bunch of he-man carpenters built this for me. It's a great setup, actually. 
and uh, it's cool that you're still doing the same radio show. Um, it's it's incredible. And um, you have appeared and presented many things, but you actually um have done many podcasts. But you have one that I'd like to focus on called Henry and Heidi, which yeah. um I loved having a listen to. Um, why did you decide to start a podcast with Heidi? I, I didn't. It was <laughs> Heidi. Heidi, uh, she and I have been working together. It was 26 years last October. So 26 years and some months. The two of us have been arguing nonstop. We argue every day. And so um, we're the best of friends. She's great. She's the smart one. And so I be, be, between Ian Mackay and Heidi, they know kind of everything that's ever happened to me, for better or for worse. And so Heidi and I, we, you know, we worked together. You know, we when I lived in Los Angeles, I had a big building, and we had offices next to each other with a wall between us to, for our own safety. But um, we would, you know, we talk all the time. And one day Heidi comes, you know, storming into my side of the building, and she goes, "Like you have told me every story that you have." I'm like, probably three times, and that's it's true. She said, how many of those stories have not made stage? I'm like, probably a lot of them. I, you know, I don't know, because I got a million of them. And she said, we need to do a podcast. And the podcast will be, I'll tee up a few stories. Like, I know what to ask you to tell, and you'll tell me the story. I said, well, I've got my one microphone to make my little radio show. And she said, well, then get two. Like, figure it out. And so... I called my pal who's an engineer, and I said, can you tell me what gear to get to have two microphones? Because I need, because the boss says I, we're making a podcast. And so you know, I buy whatever, and, uh, you know, he's the smart one. He plugs it all in. He goes, like, you talk into that one. Heidi, you talk into that one. No fighting. And that was the start of the podcast. And uh, he taught me, Henry, you press this button and that button. Voila, both mics are on. And um, here's your mix. There's no mix. It's like equal, you know, input. And um, you'll, you'll, and Heidi, uh, she's an editor and she knows how to edit. So she has an editing bay at her house. She's really smart. And so she would take the podcast and clean it up and tighten it up. If there's a few uhs and ahas or whatever, she'd get rid of them. So the thing like would lose a few minutes and kind of, you know, be a little bit better for speed. And we'd put it out there. And suddenly we have this audience and it's going to the top of iTunes and we're getting people offering us money to advertise on our podcast, which I guess is a thing. And so that was a little weird. So we did the podcast until COVID. And then, you know, lockdown, she's working out of her house. I'm working in that building. And then as the fog of COVID is lifting, I moved. I moved across the country to Nashville, Tennessee, where I'm talking to you now. And now Heidi and I are thousands of miles away from each other. And I'm sure we could do the podcast with modern technology. Um, but we just, you know, I, I went on tour and I, I just I just got off. I've been really busy uh, working on uh, some projects here. And we just kind of never got it going again. And um, I get asked about it all the time. Like, are you going to do the podcast again? And, you know, that's a good question. And uh, for which I have no good answer. Um, with this newer gear I've got here, um, I've got two mic ins and I've got some microphones. We, I think I could probably get a tutorial from my engineer pal and I could get the, the snarling blonde menace in this room and we could probably do a podcast. Um Will we? I don't know. She'll be out here pretty soon because we're going to be editing uh, two books of mine. Uh, and so uh, we'll be shoulder to shoulder arguing eight hours a day over, uh, you know, t copy, uh, uh, you know, copy editing. And so maybe, but um, people seem to like it. And I, I think one of the main reasons was like, you know, it, the price was right. You know, it's free. But uh, yeah, it got uh, people still ask me about it now. That's great, and it's a, uh, it's actually because I love podcasts myself, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. But my favorite uh, type of one is when there's stories there, 
that's why I'm such a massive fan of Henry and Heidi. And um, with all the stuff that we've spoken about and with your whole career, I was reading a, a biography on Dave Grohl and he was there was a there was pictures in it. And one of the pictures actually had a caption that said, here's Dave Grohl when he was a freshman in high school and he used to play Black Flag over the intercoms. You've inspired people such as Josh Homme. Uh, for those who don't know, Josh Homme is from Queen's Stone Age. You can catch my interview with him on my YouTube channel. Uh, you then have Dave Grohl. Um, just some really cool people. How does that feel? Um... Um, I am glad to have been an asset, and, you know, and, and Dave, you know, he's an amazing musician, a, a, a top shelf guy, you know, he, he's, he's a good man. And I used to watch him play in his band scream. And like, he's just like this blur of hair and hands. Like, like, that's not human what he's doing. I, I think I saw him the first time playing, like when he was like 16 or something, and like Ian and I just kind of stood there, like that's uh, whoa, you know, you know, I've seen Nirvana and Foo Fighters. I mean, I, I've seen different incarnations of the man, and and, and seen Josh play, and uh, th th that uh, someone of note uh, says something nice about what you do is great. Um, but you know, to credit Black Flag, I, I was one of many people in that band, you know. Uh, and in my opinion, the the really good singers are the three before me. Like if you said to me, uh, pick out a good Black Flag song, I could pick out a bunch of them. I wouldn't be singing on any of them. I, I like all the early stuff with Keith and Des and Ron. Uh, and so when they when someone says, hey, Black Flag, cool, I think well, thank you. But I think Greg Ginn, Chuck Tukowski, Robo, Des, Ron, Keith. I don't think me. I think they're saying, or maybe like my little finger or something, a little bit me. But I'm a, a little ingredient in a big pot, basically, being stirred around. And so um, it, it's, you know, I'd rather be told something nice than, hey, get out of here, you know, right? Uh, I'd, I'd rather get a pat on the back than a kick in the neck. Um, but I don't, you know, think to myself, hey, man, but it's uh, it's pretty cool when someone that you like says something nice about what you do. Like uh, some people whose music I have kind of awesome respect for and people I've awesome respect for have said to me, hey, you know, um, one of your books really got me through a tough time or, hey, I, you know, I've always liked your records and I won't name names because it's a bit much. But um, that has happened a few times in my life to where I, I never saw that coming, you know, never would have seen that coming. And so it's it's cool. Uh, I'm sure it happens to Ian Mackay kind of sort of every day. You know, he, he was one of those people that, you know, a lot of us can point to and go like, that guy, you know, he's... He's, you know, in 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 my lexicon of of heroes and people who've been an asset. And, you know, as I've been doing since I was like six years old, I lean on music really hard. You know, I um, you know, I'm kind of a depressed guy by nature, kind of gloomy all the time. Uh, so I go to the gym and I listen to music. You know, those are my two, you know, keep stress and depression at bay. Uh, and uh, to this day, fitness, good diet, and music, music, music. And so there's there's bands and records I've leaned on so hard, I'm afraid they'll they'll yell I lean on them so hard. And the the fun thing is to meet those bands, like The Damned. Are you kidding? I can't say thank you to a band enough. You know, I Iggy, David Bowie, uh, people like that. Um, you know, Black Sabbath, you know, these uh, serious main ingredients in my life, the MC5, and, you know, Brother Wayne Kramer sadly passed away recently. Um, to be able to to meet some of these bands and say thank you, or like, you know, oh, no way, uh, stuff like that. 
uh, that's happened a few times. You know, on festivals, you'll be with some band and, you know, you're allowed to go into their dressing room and shake the hand and get shuffled out. And um, that has been really gratifying because, as again, as I told you before, I started as a fan and I remain a fan. And so getting a compliment from someone you admire is cool. But getting to meet that person and say, oh, you're great. Um, <laughs> I, I've never gotten over it. And, um, you know, I, and, and those are names I will drop. You know, get to meet the Ramones. I did it. And, uh, you know, David Bowie, met David Bowie, shook the hand. I, I don't know the guy, but I got to meet him. And uh, he was very kind, <laughs> suffered my fanboy questions. <laughs> and um, that kind of thing, uh, it just brings the music home. Um, when I lived in Los Angeles, I saw people I recognized from music and film pretty often because I lived in Hollywood and you go out to eat dinner somewhere and like there's that guy and that guy and that gal and you know they're on that show or that movie and yeah I leave them alone uh, I'm definitely afraid of walking up to someone knowing I'm pretty crazy it's like hey I really like your band and having that person say, get away from me which would kind of ruin my fanboy listening experience and so not having suffered that yet I tread very carefully around people I recognize uh, sometimes I'm introduced properly, but rarely have I ever walked up and said, excuse me, uh, <laughs> I stick my hand out. I've done it a couple of times uh, just because, uh, you know, why not? And luckily it worked out. And it, it worked out. Uh, I did that to Ike Turner once uh, 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 at, a, at a film premiere. Like there's Ike Turner and no one's, uh, you look him up. Uh, and uh, I was standing around with someone. I go, that's Ike Turner. Like, no way. Like, of Ike and Tina Turner. And uh, I said, yeah. let's, go, let's go talk to Ike Turner. He's like, hell no, I'm not going over there. It's like terrifying. It's like a human barracuda. And I'm like, screw it. Hold my drink. I'm going over there. And I just walked over. I said, hey, hey Mr. Turner, uh, with the, the Delta Cats, you wrote Rocket 88. You invented rock and roll, which is kind of a, a big American uh, uh, myth. And he went, you know, so I basically gave him a huge compliment. I said, you invented rock and roll. He said, yes, I did. Very good to meet you, young man. He shook my hand. I said, I'm out of here before it all went bad. And so that's one of the only times I've ever just like walked over there because, you know, I don't want to be told, you know, take a hike. I'd rather just listen that to is... <laughs> Well, I mean, look, you're a very humble, funny clever, philosophical guy. So you have, that. where are we saying you've inspired tons of people. Uh, you do, people ask you to do something and you just do it because you know you can. But for those who are trying to get onto the scene or trying to become a spoken word artist, to try and do what they love, what tips would you give them? Um. Well, what I what helped me get through my life in the entertainment business, if you want to call it that, was five years in Black Flag, where I thought I knew what hard work was. You know, my parents were both like they were both really hardworking, like hyper achievement oriented people. And I got some of that from them. So I thought when I joined Black Flag, I'm a hardworking guy. I'm in this boring job 60 hours a week. Then I joined Black Flag. And it was like joining the Marine Corps as far as learning curve. It was basically sheer vertical. Greg Ginn and Chuck Tukowski, you could not exhaust them. They were unstoppable. They were like terminators. Like, no sleep? Go play. Don't feel good? Go play. Like, I would watch Greg play two sets, walk off stage, having one of those summer colds that are horrible, vomit into a trash can walk right back out for the encore. You're like, Greg, sit down. We got two guitars. Des is playing guitar. We can do this without you. are like, nope. And so I learned what hard work was by being in Black Flag. And if it doesn't break you, it'll make you kind of unstoppable. And so I hung in there as best I could. I could never equal their work ethic, but I could cling tenaciously. And so I learned from them to never give up and to even if it hurts, you keep going. And if there's something you really want to do, you have to learn a new definition of wanting. 
but you've got to want it more than your next breath, or at least as much, to the point of being in a state of constant desperation, to where you're brave out of fear of failure, to where you're fearless, not because you're, I'm not a brave guy, but I became fearless because like, go, and like, it just becomes this implicit directive. And so I learned that in Black Flag, and it's basically informed everything else I've ever done. And so if you want to be in a band or like stand up comedy, which I would never venture into, it looks terrifying. But, you know, being on stage on your own with a microphone or whatever, you just have to really want it. And you'll see how much you want it when the rubber meets the road, like where you're in the garage and the songs aren't happening for days at a time. And you want to throttle the drummer, a common ailment. Um, you, you have to want it more than your next meal. And you have to be ready to miss the next meal, to do anything it takes. Not murder. You don't hurt anybody. You just learn to go without if that's what it takes. Like, I'm going to pay the rent, and then I'm going to eat beans and rice, but I'm going to buy guitar strings or a laptop so I can write my book or notebook paper. So like, I'm, I'm going to get it done. I'll write it in my own blood. But you can't, you have to be in a mindset of, I will not be stopped. And fun? Uh, I don't know about that. In that making music for me was never all that fun. It was like bloodletting. It, it was in me. It had to come out. Uh, playing was physically painful because I, you know, I'm sure you can find some videos. I went for it as hard as I could to the point of I walk all crooked now because I've, I've wrecked my back and broken bones, lots of concussions, got kicked in the head, lots of stitches, um, knocked out, uh, passed out because <laughs> um, I wanted to do it. And so determination, discipline, focus, tenacity, and as much as you can, and if you, you know, if you take anything away from you and me hanging out, gratitude, man, you must be grateful in your sleep, in the shower, the next drink of water, the next meal, the next day, as uh, an old pal of mine named Kay used to say, that you don't wake up upside down at the bottom of a river. Gratitude, uh, grateful for your audience grateful for the opportunity to be in front of people, grateful, grateful, grateful. Looks like the room you're in doesn't look like the roof is leaking. That's great, man. And so I am, the older I get, the more aware I become how much gratitude is kind of the, the fuel that keeps it going. I, am, uh, I have an audience. I'm obsessed with them. I fear failing them. I, I literally work seven days a week. I live alone. I work alone. I, I go to the gym. I go to the supermarket. I pick up my mail and I come back to the desk. That's kind of my life. And then I listen to music at night. And so my nine to five is making things I'm hoping someone might like, like a radio show where you get to the end of the two hours and it didn't suck. Or a book that you can get through and go, okay, well, eh, you know, it wasn't horrible. Uh, I'll keep checking them out. And believe it or not, it's not about money. It's not about fame. It's about doing something. And the fact that someone shows up, I, I'm probably one of the most grateful people you'll ever meet. I, I am astonished that anyone shows up. I, I can't believe it. And I'm, I'm grateful. And if you can remain grateful, even for like, you get one gig with your band and then the tour folds up and goes home. Hey, you know, hold on to that. And so gratitude has been a real instructive fuel for me uh, to get through times where, you know, COVID was really rough, like tours would cancel. And we'll, we'll try again next year, not next month. We'll try again in a year. You know, I'm not 22 anymore. I'm looking at, you know, maybe tapping out on all of this, like another year whoa, you know, but hopefully there'll be an audience waiting. And so gratitude will get you through times of no food. Like, I'll never forget this. I was in Bristol, Tennessee with Bill Stevenson, Black Flag, 1984, December. We had a night off 
and we had just played in Knoxville, Tennessee. We were going to drive like hellions overnight up to Washington, D.C. to go see some band called Motorhead play, I think, the Ontario Theater. And their management got a hold of our people and said, how about Black Flag be the surprise opening band? Are you kidding me, man? We're driving like on our rear wheels to get to D.C. to get on that stage and open for Motorhead. Or, like, come on. W one of our vans, the engine basically melts down. And just like, you know, it, it just goes away in Bristol, which is on the way to Washington, D.C. We pull it into a gas station and the guy basically says, your van is a heap of metal. You know, it'll never move again. And we're watching, you know, now the, 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 the band is going to go on in two hours. Like the night is over. We're going to spend it in the snow with no money, really. Hopefully getting a cup of coffee at a Dunkin' Donuts or a 7-Eleven. And I remember standing with Bill, you know, drummer of the Descendants, in the snow, <laughs> looking at a 7-Eleven. And I said, man, no motorhead, no van. We're screwed, man. And he, we looked at the guy behind the counter of the 7-Eleven in his orange smock, you know, ringing people out. And I'm not putting the guy down. It's a good job. And he pointed at the guy and he said, but at least we're free. I'm like, whoa, Bill. Okay, Plato. <laughs> like, whoa, that's deep, man. And he kind of summed up the whole thing, like in a single sentence. Like, yeah, we're out here. Uh, as David Lee Roth used to say, on the sea of consequence, um, just kind of, you know, riding the wild. Um, and some days the van's going to burn up. Hey, man, uh, at least you're not punching a time clock. And so there's that. And that is stuck in my mind. I I've never forgotten that. And um, that's, uh, again, but it goes back to gratitude. And... Um, that for me has been, you know, I'm, I'm not an ambitious person. I, I have resolve instead of ambition. Ambition makes you like step on someone's hands as you're trying to climb over them. I don't want to do that. I just want to be the person who doesn't quit. Like, hey, Henry, you're bleeding out of your mouth. Yeah, but I'm going to get it done. You lost an arm. Yeah, I got, but I got another one. And so that's resolve. But it's gratitude that fuels it, that I get to do it. And so um, that has served me well. Because, you know, at this point, I'm an old ass man. I am old and I still get to do stuff. And what else can I be but grateful? You know, that is a great way to live, to just be grateful to be alive. I love that. Um, and now before you go, I want to actually ask um, a bit of a question for the, fo for the fun of it. Um, you are a massive record collector. Oh. Um, so I wanted to ask you, are there any new records or records that aren't so well known that you'd like to recommend to people? Yeah. Um, what I would recommend is, um, and, and I'm not, this isn't a shameless plug, but to answer your question clearly, um, henryrollins.com, my website, um, you can pull down the, the radio show notes of all my radio broadcasts and literally see all the songs I'm playing or go to kcrw.com and hear the show for free. And you can hear what is interesting to me. And so I buy new records all the time, all the time. I mean, I, I have like, you know, at least five or six legs in the past cause I'm old. And so bands like the damned and the ruts and, and the UK subs and all of that is relevant to me. But a bunch of obstreperous 19 year olds making music is sounds good to me. And so I'm buying new records from, from, from Bandcamp and, and from record labels that I know and don't know. Uh, Discord puts out great records every year. I, you know, I'm, I'm putting those on the radio show. Um, Ipecac, Mike Patton's label, he's doing great work. Of course, the, uh, the OCs, uh, John Dwyer of the OCs, he's got Castle Face, great label, In the Red Records, great label. Uh, all those people are in my universe i'm you know they're sending me tracks i'm listening i'm putting stuff on people write me like dude 
you know, I, I know your radio show. I think you'd like this band. Go to a band camp address. I listen. I like. I buy. And I put them on the radio show. And so I, I play a lot of, lot of you know, really loud, obnoxious punk rock, which always works for me. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a label called Goner, I believe, out of Memphis, Tennessee. Great label. Uh, uh, great punk labels out of Germany, Spain, Italy. Uh, Goodbye Boozy, great punk label out of Italy. They put out radical records. Uh, Total Punk, great punk label. But I, I, I make my listeners listen to a lot of like, you know, John Coltrane, you know, and I, I would beg you, uh, Logan, to to keep your ears open as a listener. I mean, I was raised as a listener by my mom who had, in my opinion, pitch perfect taste in music. Like I don't have every record she had. I don't need 14 Barbara Streisand records, but Barbara Streisand can really sing. So I was raised on Bartok, Stravinsky, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, show tunes, Glenn Campbell, Dionne Warwick, Burt Bacharach. You know, my mom's music. As a little kid, you know, she put records on. And then, you know, Beatles, The Doors, I kind of got my own thing going. And so I'm the guy who goes to the record store. I'm on eBay, Discogs, every day, obsessively, uh, Bandcamp. Uh, people write me uh, making suggestions. I will listen to any suggestion sent to me. Bandcamp makes it easy. Click, listen, like, don't like, yay, nay. And so I listen to it. There's a, a, I'm playing a ton of bands from Australia right now. Great band called uh, The Chimers, uh, TV Repairman, uh, 1-800-Mikey. Uh, uh, if you listen to my radio show, sometimes it seems like it's from Australia. There's so many Australian bands, but in Australia, every third building's a record store or a venue, and every other person's in a band. And so they bring it on themselves, being so good all the time. I must buy those records and play them. And I was just there a few months ago, and I came back, as usual, with an extra suitcase of records. And so I'm always looking. I'm very open-minded. I listen to a lot, a lot of noise music, like avant music, uh, avant jazz music. A lot of you know, kind of crazy cut and paste collage laptop music. It's all interesting to me. Not so much on the country western music. It's just it, a lot of talent in that genre. It's just never been my wheelhouse. Um, but I, I'm always up for hearing whatever's happening. Um, I think what happens in a hundred years, you'll be old like me. Don't fall into the trap of claiming it was better when I was young and these young people don't know what they're doing. Because now you sound like Frank Sinatra talking about the Jimi Hendrix experience. And Frank Sinatra, you should hear. The guy could really sing. But about the Jimi Hendrix experience, he was wrong. He was closed-minded. He became a man of his time. May that never happen to you because you'll miss out on a lot of fun where you can be a creaky old guy like me and still go to the gig. And I go to shows all the time. And I stand in the back so no one runs into me and breaks my hip. But I, I like it, and I, I, I'm still open to it, you know, because I've always been open to it. I always want to go to the gig. Like going to the show, I mean, that's what you do, man. You go to the show. As soon as I could, I did. And, and even now, I do. And luckily, I live in a city that everyone seems to come through here. And so, um, hey, man, may it never end. And so um, I I buy records. I haven't, it's early where I am. I haven't bought any records yet today, but give me some time. I'll find something. Wow. I will definitely make sure to check out your website and check out all those tracks and start to have a listen. Henry, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. It's been great discussing your career. um, And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. It's cool to meet you. And let me say, I admire and respect you for what you're doing. Like you're obviously curious, you're moving with it. And uh, best of luck as you go forward with all of this. Uh, Fantastic work you're doing. Thank you so much, Henry. Have a lovely day. Okay, bye.